So Bell Hooks was uh, born to a working class family in Kentucky, and she attended first initially racially segregated schools. It, this is important because most people nowadays don't have the experience of having attended uh, schools that were segregated, but she did. Part of her schooling was in a school that didn't allow um, for uh, white people to attend, and part of her schooling was integrated. Uh, I think what's really interesting is that uh, Bell Hooks came out with the conclusion that she was uh, worse off in the schools that were integrated because they were integrated under white supremacy. They were not integrated in a way that was welcoming for people of color. So she felt more comfortable actually when the schools were segregated than later on. In 76, he became an English professor and senior lecturer in ethnic studies at the University of Southern California. Uh, and she started using her name with lower keys, Bell Hooks, for two reasons. One of them is because her grandmother was called Bell Hooks and she thought that her grandma was a real deal. So she wanted to honor her mom with a pen name, a grandmother with a pen name, but didn't want to pretend that she was as good as her grandma. And the other one is because as many people after 1968 started rethinking the issue of authorship. How important is it when we put our name under something that we wrote and thought about? Or is this really the result of uh, social construction? Even if we are the ones that did most of the thinking and the writing, isn't all of our thinking part of our socialization? Don't we get our ideas from conversations and uh, talks that we had with other people? So always with lower keys, both of them. And she taught at Yale, Oberlin, and other universities, but finally she got her PhD in 1983, so rather late. The title of the book uh, that you read some chapters for today is called Feminism is for Everyone. And what she's emphasizing here is that feminism is not just for women. It's not really connected with uh, our bodies. It's connected with uh, social interactions that we have. Uh, and we need to um, think about it from that perspective. So her definition of feminism, very important, is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. As you can see, she's not saying that it's a movement for women to always be um, on top. We are saying that it's something that benefits anybody who's the object of sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. So for example, if you were a gay man, feminism would be something that you would want people to uphold. If you're a man that doesn't conform with uh, the ideal of masculinity that we have in this society, uh, aggressiveness, um, self-assertiveness, there's a number of, of uh, kind of uh, almost, um, it's like a framework that we have for idea of, fem of masculinity. So if you don't fit into that, feminism is also good for you. So uh, her question is, what is feminism? A movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. So what is sexism? Both discrimination based on gender and the attitudes, stereotypes, and the cultural elements that promote this discrimination. Prejudice plus power. So uh, this is similar to a definition of racism. When we talk about racism, we always say that reverse racism is not really a thing. And we say this because I might have privileges as a woman, but if I don't have power as a woman, I cannot really oppress anybody. As a woman in this society, all women have less power than men. So we are not in a situation where we can oppress anybody. So no matter what kind of prejudices I might have against men, I don't have the power as a woman to oppress men. So very important is prejudice plus power. So if we are talking of people of color, for example, we would say the same thing. A person of color might be extremely biased against white people, extremely biased. They might even become violent against white people. But it's not racism because they don't have the societal power to really inflict harm to a group of people. They might be able to inflict harm to one person. But racism is not about individual exchanges, it's about 
what we can do as a society and as groups of people. So with, uh, with sexism, we have the same idea. The power piece is super important. All sexist thinking and action is a problem, whether those who perpetrate it are male or female, child or adult. Women can take on the uh, attributes of the, or, or the uh, actions that uh, patriarchs do. So women, children, anybody can enact sexism. It's very important to realize this because that means that men can stop being sexist too if they decide so. It's not connected with our bodies. It's an ideology. It's something that we picked up from the environment, from the way that we were raised, from the schools that we attended, from the media. Particularly, a lot of sexism comes from the media stereotypes. So anybody can perpetrate sexism and we need to be careful with that. So what is patriarchy? Patriarchy is one form of social stratification via power dominance hierarchy. An ancient and ongoing social system based on traditions of elitism, a ranking of inferiorities, and its privileges. So one form of social stratification, patriarchy. White supremacy would be a racial stratification. Capitalism, so uh, under capitalism we have class. In India we have caste and class. Under capitalism we have class. So many people think that these different systems, class, race, gender, sexuality, cannot be really separated. Whenever we think of oppression in, under capitalism, we need to sort of think about all these lines, not just patriarchy or not just class. And Bell Hooks particularly is very interested in um, forefronting uh, patriarchal domination under capitalism, and most specifically how this patriarchal domination affects women of color. So feminism is not against men. It's against male-dominated processes. Another way of thinking of patriarchy is thinking about male-dominated processes. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a guy on top telling us what to do. It could be a woman that's enacting what we call male-dominated processes. Bell Hook said that um, women-only households can raise patriarchs. That's not impossible at all, and in the same way, men can be feminists. There are many men who are feminists, actually. So what Bell Hooks wants is a world of equals. A feminist revolution alone will not create such a world. We need to end racism, class elitism, and imperialism. And she doesn't say this but because it's an older text, but nowadays we could also tag on some other things here. For example, ableism. Uh, do we uh, empower people who are able-bodied and do we leave aside people who are either uh, physically or mentally impaired without really trying to accommodate them? Under capitalism, is this something that happens often? Transphobia, she doesn't talk about that, but it's also another issue of oppression. Body shaming, women need to have certain shapes, men also, increasing and are expected to have a certain body shape. So feminism is also against uh, body shaming, fat shaming, etc. Ageism, very important for me. Are we less intelligent as we grow older? Should we be, um, you know, not taking into account uh, for certain jobs or certain tasks? And under capitalism, age is a big deal. Right now, you are getting the benefits of, of being young under capitalism. It doesn't last forever. You'll see what happens uh, soon. <laughs> so uh, she talks about how feminism came to be, particularly in the United States. And she identifies as a big problem for women what she calls Christian values. In a, uh, if you remember, Nietzsche also had a huge problem with Christian values, but not this kind of problems. Nietzsche's problems were the herd values of Christianity. On the, uh, uh, Bell Hooks, on the other hand, is concerned with the uh, male-dominated processes of Christianity. So she says, even as women are part of the working population, they are still envisioned as mothers and housewives. You know, the second shift, no? We, we work, we are expected to work nowadays. Our parents expect us to co go to school, get a degree, have a good job. Then if you marry, you marry. But we are expected to do this second shift. 
and sometimes we hear that men help us. So when we say that um, my partner is really nice, he helps me with the household chores, what I'm saying is this is my job, and I'm so lucky that I have a guy who's helping me with my chore. Um, so she talks about how this was undone, in a way, by the consciousness raising groups. So these were groups of women that got together and talk about their, their, their lives, about their bodies, they even research into their own bodies. As you know, women don't know very well what we look like. So they did all that, those research, and that was a space that was very important for feminist actions, for coordinations. She says that these were anti-hierarchical spaces where women's voices needed to be heard, and it planted the seeds of what we now call the women's studies uh, departments in many universities. Um, we call them now WGSS, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, along with ethnic, ethnic studies and black studies. These uh, departments did not exist before the 70s. These departments are created at different universities as a result of this mobilization of women that wanted to study uh, from a perspective that was not male dominated. But the, this, um, this groups started disappearing and Bell Hook says that feminism became increasingly liberal, white, and corporate. When you think of Hillary Clinton, that's a typical example of what we call liberal or corporate feminism. Uh, her whole speech, her whole campaign was about breaking the glass ceiling as if women's only problem were to get a better job. What about women of color that have other kinds of issues? That was not taken into account. What about women that cannot work? What about women who are disabled, et cetera, et cetera? What about the homes that we lost after the 2008 economic crisis? How come Hillary had no word about that? What about the jobs that are constantly being taken out of the United States and placed in, in countries where there's less um, surveillance of the salaries that are paid and the laws that are broken when it comes to the environment? All of that was an example of corporate feminism, and it's something that women of color nowadays are very wary of because they feel that this struggle of feminism left them out. Many, many women are coming up with that. So there's talks about a third wave of feminism by women of color. So Bell Hooks uh, follows uh, Nietzsche and Foucault in her analysis of power. And she says that power is a relation that traverses all human relations. So whenever we connect with each other, we are in some sort of power relation. We talk about that a little bit when we talked about Nietzsche how in a regular class I would be the master and you would be enslaved because I hold your grades, right? So that determines a certain dynamic. How free are you to learn if you're, if you're afraid that you might say something that will drop your grade? There is a power relationship in every class that you take quite clearly, and many people think that that power relation actually um, goes against our possibilities of learning. So Hooks calls to overcome the ma master-slave relation even within groups that live in a situation of brutal oppression. So what she's referring to here is, for example, black women who are abused by their black partners. It's a complicated uh, thing because we know that black men are oppressed by white supremacy, especially in the United States. So if this man attacks his partner, can we analyze the situation in exactly the same way as we would analyze a white man attacking his partner? Bell Hook says that we cannot, that at the same time we cannot give this man a free pass, but also the analysis needs to take into account that this man is the object himself of a, a power relationship that oppresses him. So she thinks that we need to be very careful when we analyze oppression within communities of color to frame them within a general uh, makeup of uh, white supremacy. So the only way to talk about oppression in a black home, homestead is framing it within white supremacy, 
we do not leave that out and we explain that this is a person that has been also the object of discrimination. It could be discrimination at many levels, but we know, because we know that in the United States there's, there's racism, that this black man is also the object of discrimination, so we cannot analyze the situation in exactly the same way as we do when we see two white people. So she talks about the evolution of feminism. She says that we went from anger at men to understand that male-dominated processes can be upheld by women as well. So the focus was now on gender justice rather than against men. She also says that sisterhood had to acknowledge that there were class and racial differences amongst women and that some women oppress other women. So for example, we know that now women go to work. This was not the case in the 50s. Women mostly stood behind the white picket fence, right? So when a woman goes to work, eh, what does she do with the household stuff? What happens if you work all day, especially if you have a very good paying job and you are out of the home 14, 15 hours? How do we solve the issue of house, household chores, raising of the children, cleaning the house. You hire somebody to do it for you, usually it's women of color, yeah. So this is what Bell Hook says. She says, well, white women solve the issue of going to work and having somebody take care of, of their homes, but they solve it by oppressing other women. Because obviously, if you are paying somebody to do the job at home, it means that you're making at least three or four more times than what you're paying. Otherwise, it would make no sense. You wouldn't be able to afford anybody to clean your home. So that's something that Bell Hooks thinks is important for us to acknowledge. She says also, white liberal women almost want gender equality in the workforce in a white supremacist environment. Many women of color and revolutionary women think that women will not achieve equality under present white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. So she's saying that for white women it was sort of like a given that they could go out on the workforce and be empowered in this way, but this is not a given for women of color. And she says, gradually feminism lost its revolutionary edge. Conservative and liberal feminists were content with their acquired freedoms as their higher income allow them to exploit other women to do women's jobs. So she calls for alliances, because she still thinks that we are all women, although we have to acknowledge that we have different income levels and expectations, but we need to acknowledge the differences. So she's talking about something that she doesn't call by name, but it's something like intersectionality. Let's look at all the issues of oppression resistance that we go through, gender, sexuality, race, class, and acknowledge where we stand. Men, white women, everybody needs to be involved in raising all women's status, and we need to move away from being victims to struggle with all and for all. And here again, we have echoes of Nietzsche. So she's against what she calls binary identity politics. Uh, and we will see that Ansaldúa also goes into that. The binary is something that we usually connect with the West. It's either black or white, good or bad, but she thinks things are more complicated than that. 